Hello everyone, Mr. B here, and oh, the potato, it's back. Not all of you are going to get that reference, and it's going to show. Anyway, um, so yesterday we started chapter three, and you saw a little video that talked about this whole idea of sensation. And so for the next few days, we're going to learn about a few of our senses. So without further ado, let's just get right into it. And today what we're going to be talking about is we're actually going to be covering two modules and we're going to be going a little quick. So if ever, you can always pause, hello Skylar, um, and go back. But we're going to look at module 3.2 and we're going to look at vision and how vision works. And then we're also going to be doing module 3.3 to see how sound works and how hearing works. All right, and since I have a distracting cat, we're going to disappear now. Ooh, or we're going to get bigger. Show off my cat. I totally didn't do that on purpose. Anyway, here we go. So with vision, um, especially with human vision, it has to do with being able to see light rays. And if you look at this range or this spectrum, this is showing all the different electromagnetic rays that are out there um, or waves that are out there. So you have things like radio waves, television waves, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays, all of these different wavelengths of light. And what we can see with the human eye is just this much right here. So that's it. So there's other creatures out there that can see more. We are creating technology such as, such as infrared to be able to see more. But as far as the human eye is concerned, we can just see this much. And the way that it works, and I'm not going to go into huge detail, but essentially light comes in through the front of the eye, as you can see, and it hits the cornea, which is this kind of clear area that covers and protects your eye. And it also refracts light, as you can see. Um, so it goes to the open area of your eye. And then you have your iris. And your iris is the colored part of your eye. So you might have brown eyes, green eyes, blue eyes, hazel eyes, all of that. What makes that color is the iris. And this is kind of a cross section right here would be the iris that kind of circles around the eye. And what it does is it expands and contracts, in a sense, as a series of muscly fibers, and it lets in more and less light. So the best way, and I'm actually bringing myself back, and don't worry, my cat's already left. The best way to describe this is the aperture of a camera. So if you take a nice camera and you take off the front of it, this has the aperture, you'll see that if I start to open it up, there we go, you'll see that the hole gets bigger. So this lets in the most amount of light and then this lets in the least amount of light. That area that's getting kind of bigger and smaller, this area right here, that's like the iris of our eye. And there we go. The hole that it's creating that allows the light to go through, in fact, there we go, ah, um, is our pupil, essentially. So a lot of people think that the pupil of our eye is just this black dot. That's not right. It's a hole that leads in all the light. So when you're looking in kind of the black dot of someone's eye, when you're looking in the pupil, you're actually looking at the inside of their eye, which of course is dark. There's no light in there. Um, so again, just to show that opening is like your pupil and then your iris is what gets bigger and smaller to let in more and less light. Pretty cool, huh? A lot of people think it's just a black dot. All right, so back to that. So as I mentioned, you have the iris, and that's what's getting bigger and smaller to let in more and less light. So again, this, like, there isn't even a thing that's really your pupil. Your pupil is just this opening, and it can be bigger or smaller. 
And so the lens is what then focuses the light, which then focuses it so it'll be nice and clear on the back of your eye. And as you can see, as it goes through, it flips upside down. And as you saw in what I just showed with the aperture of the camera, the image is upside down. But don't worry, your brain figures it out. And essentially, the reason why some of us need glasses is that this lens isn't shaped correctly. And so when it goes through to the back, it's blurry. And so what we need is another layer uh, to refract the light so by the time it hits the back of our eyeball, it's focused. But the important part for this chapter is that when it hits the back of your eye, known as the retina, all of that information from that light is activating all these cells that are at the back of your eye, and those cells then take that information and it travels down the optic nerve to, as you learned in the last chapter, the occipital lobe, where there's the visual cortex, which is in charge of vision. And this is kind of a close-up of the back of the eye, so the retina. And as you can see, there's different types of cells, and you got your rods and your cones, which remember, those are the sensory receptors, which is important to remember. But it takes that information and translates it, it translates light into neural impulses, which is something that your brain can understand, and then it shoots down the optic nerve. Because again, if there is one thing that you take um, from this idea of sensation, is what your senses do, is it takes in information from the outside world and translates that information into a language that your brain understands. That's what your senses do. And we're going to see a ton of examples. It takes in all that information for sight. It happens to be light. It takes in that light and translates it into neural impulses for your brain to understand. All right, continuing on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. When we look at vision, obviously for a lot of us, we don't just see in black and white, we see in color. And essentially there's two different theories as to how color works. The first one is known as the trichromatic theory. And essentially what this means is that there are three types of cone, cones sorry, in the retina, and each of them has a certain chemical makeup that responds to one of three colors. It's either green, kind of a blue-violet, or red. That's it. Those, as far as vision is concerned, are the primary colors. And the whole idea is that then your cones are firing off combinations of red, or yeah, red, green, and blue, and they create all the different colors out there. And there's an example of this, but I am going to very quickly pass this over to Mr. B. Thank you, Mr. B. Now, an actual example of the trichromatic theory that shows that it works is in front of you every single day that you come to school, a projector or a screen. And if you're watching this on a screen, if you zoom in, do you see those teeny little squares? If we zoom into that a little bit more, it'll look like this. And as you can see, the only colors available are green, blue, and red. So even when you see something yellow, it's just a combination, or a lack thereof, of the green, blue, and red. So you don't actually ever see yellow on a screen. Back to you, Mr. B. Thanks, Mr. B. So again, and there's a really cool video um, that you can see about this that I've included on Schoology. Um, done by, I think it was Vsauce, that you never actually see the real color yellow on any screen because it's just a combination of green and blue and red, and yet we interpret it as yellow. But that's the trichromatic theory, and the way to remember it is trichromatic three colors. Tri, like a tricycle. All right. The next theory 
for colored vision is the opponent process theory. And this one's kind of similar because, again, it's saying that there's three kinds of cells that respond, but you have the color and then you have its opposite. So you have this cell that's firing, let's say, every time that there's something that's red. The cell is firing off red, 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 red. But then when you see something green, it's the lack of that cell firing. So you have the color that you see when it's firing, and then you have the opposite, the opponent of that color. So you have red with the opponent being green, blue with the opponent being yellow, black with the opponent being white. And just like the previous one with the trichromatic theory that had the example with, you know, computer screens and projectors, there's also um, evidence for the opponent process theory. And this is known as an after image. And to show the after image, we are going to do a very quick experiment. And all that I want you to do is stare at the black dot in the middle of the screen. So there's a black dot in the middle of the screen, and all I want you to do is stare at the black dot. Try your best not to blink. If you have to blink, you can blink, but try your best to just be staring at that black dot. And we're gonna stare at that black dot, again, trying our best not to blink for just a little bit longer, just a teeny bit longer staring at that black dot without blinking. And now I'm going to take you to a white screen. And what I want you to do is look and see what you see. You might need to blink every once in a while, but tell me what you see. All right, and if this worked properly, then what you probably saw was a red, white, and blue flag. So, the American flag. This is an example of an after image. And the whole idea is that when you saw this flag, the cells in your eye at the back in the retina were firing for green, yellow, and black, green, yellow, and black, green, yellow, and black. And so it fired for so long and it got so tired because you were staring for so long that then when I went to a blank screen, you saw the opposite. You saw the after image. So an after image helps to kind of show that the opponent process theory is also an accurate way of explaining color. Um, and essentially what this means is it's not that one theory is correct and the other one's wrong because there's evidence for both. So it seems like it could be kind of a combination of both. Um, but as far as this class is concerned, it's important to know both of those theories. Another quick thing, um, not everybody can see all of the colors. Most people are what we call trichromats. It means you can see the three, again, primary colors. But there's also um, individuals known as dichromats. And dichromats can see two out of the three. So if you are struggling to see the shape that is being produced in the image on the right, you might actually be a dichromat, where you can see some color vision, um, but not all of it. And a lot of times it's struggling with, if I recall correctly, the red and green. And then, of course, you have the monochromat, sorry. And a monochromat is when you can only see black and white. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there's different types of color blindness. But anyway, now we're going to go into hearing. And with hearing, again, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail um, since this is an intro sight class, but essentially, like vision uses light waves, hearing uses sound waves. And so the sound waves come in through our outer ear. And essentially all that your outer ear does is it acts as a tunnel. It just funnels in those sound waves and brings it in. This is why if, and I'll bring myself back very quickly, if you cup your hand like this and kind of extend the tunnel out, you can actually hear better because it's funneling the sound waves in better. And that's why if somebody ever wants to hear something better, they go like that. It actually works. You're making a better tunnel. But that's what the outer ear does. Then we have this middle ear. Um, and the middle ear has these semicircular canals, which we'll talk about in more detail in the later chapter. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, we're going to talk about later in this chapter. 
Um, and then we have the ossicles. The ossicles are the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, which you can see a zoom up of right here. And essentially what it does is it takes those sound waves and it more finely tunes it. Because again, there can be some really loud noises out there, so it finely tunes it. Um, they're very, very small bones uh, in our ears. And then it goes to the inner ear, where the most important thing is the cochlea. Um, which is named after a shell, because it looks like a shell. And if we took this cochlea and kind of stretched it out or unfolded it just a little bit, you would see all these little hair follicles or hair cells. And these are what then pick up on the vibrations that come from sound waves. And ultimately, they are what, again, translate those waves into neural impulses that are then sent to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe in the brain. So again, and again, I'm bringing myself back. I cannot stress enough what our senses do is it's bringing in information from the outside world, in this case, sound waves, and translating those sound waves into neural impulses that your brain understands. Again, that's what our senses do. They're translators for our brain. They communicate between the outside world and our mind. All right, continuing on. And then just some kind of facts about sound. When we talk about things, we have amplitude. And you can have a low amplitude or a high amplitude, and that has to do with volume. So if you have a low amplitude, it's very soft. If you have a high amplitude, it's very loud. I didn't want to get too loud. And then you have frequency. You can have a low frequency, which just means that one sound wave or one cycle of that wave takes longer, and these are for lower pitches. Then you have higher frequency that have closer together cycles, and they are for higher pitches. And essentially, similar to vision, there's different theories as to how we pick up on different sounds, both high sounds, low sounds, and in the middle. So for high sounds or high pitch sounds, we have the place theory. And essentially what this is saying is that it is the place on the basilar membrane, so those hair cells, it's the place in the cochlea where it vibrates. So if I very quickly go back to the picture, of the ear. Essentially, it's saying that the placement of where this vibrates, so if it's way up here versus way down here, that is what determines higher pitches. So it's all about the place. So the way that I like to remember that is I think, you know, oh, when I'm in psychology, I feel like I'm in such a high place. So high place, place theory is for those high frequencies. The frequency theory on the other hand, is kind of the opposite, is for the lower frequencies. And instead of really caring about where on the hair cells it's vibrating or where in the cochlea, it's more at what frequency it's vibrating. Is it slower or is it quicker? So that goes back to what we were saying right here, where it's looking more at the frequency. And this is for explaining more of those lower frequency and lower sounds. So we've got place theory for high frequency, frequency theory for lower frequency, and then we have something known as the volley principle. And if you think about volleyball, when you play volleyball, a ball is going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And so the volley principle is essentially saying that for those middle of the road frequencies, those kind of middle frequencies that aren't super high and aren't super low, we use a combination. It's a volley. Um, so it's looking at the information of frequency, it's looking at the information of place, and then it figures out kind of those in-between sounds. Just a little bit more, because again, I try not to exceed 20 minutes. Our hearing is very important, and sometimes we don't take good care of our hearing. And so just some food for thought. When we're talking about how loud a sound is, which again has to do with amplitude, we measure it in decibels. And just like you can look at some of the examples of you know, things that are lower decibels and higher decibels, but what I wanna show you 
is around 85-ish is when you start to have hearing damage. If you are exposed to something with decibels of 85 or higher for an ex um, a an ex uh, prolonged exposure. However, we don't feel discomfort from these louder sounds until about 110. What this means, and I can't stress it enough, is that if we're listening to music really loud or we're in a really loud place, just because it isn't causing us discomfort, just because it doesn't hurt, does not mean that it's not damaging our ears. And this happens all the time with individuals that listen to music really loud. You know, they're really jamming, they're really getting into it, but it's causing permanent damage to their hearing because it's too loud. And what I like to say is if it's so loud that you cannot hear the world around you at all, that's too loud. It's also a bit of a safety thing. You want to be able to hear your surroundings at least a little bit. I'll get off my high horse. Anyway, food for thought. And then the last thing, speaking of hearing damage, um, there's different types of deafness. You have conduction deafness, which has to do with damage to the conductors, the thing that conduct sound. So this is the middle ear. And again, this is where you have the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And so, you know, you can puncture the eardrum. Um, the occipital, or sorry, the ossicles uh, don't vibrate properly, so they don't even send the message to the cochlea, which then, of course, can't send the message to your ear. Um, and then there's also nerve deafness. And so these are the hair cells in our cochlea getting damaged. And so they're not as good as they used to be, and so they can't send that information again to our brain. They can't translate as well because they're not picking up on it. Um, cochlear implants can help with this, um, which is essentially like an artif artificial cochlea. And so it translates for you. Um, but this is just showing that there's different types of deafness out there, and you can have a perfectly functioning ear, but if that message can't make it to the brain, you're not going to hear anything. Just like you can have perfectly functioning eyes, but if for some reason that information can't get from your eye to your occipital lobe, you're not going to see anything. But that is it. What we are going to be covering. I'm going to move myself ever so slightly. What we are going to be covering tomorrow is we're going to be looking at a few more of the senses. So ones that you know, like taste and smell and touch. But we're also going to talk about two more senses that you might not have realized that we had. But that'll be for tomorrow.